All right, hello. Welcome and thank you for joining us for our panel. Um, for those of you who have not gotten a chance to swing by our table already, um, I'm Darren Mueller um, from Retail Cafe. This is my partner, um, Sal, also from Retail Cafe. And uh, we're going to do a panel here about making comics and we're going to go through some of the steps in the process and uh, we're going to discuss some of the intricacies of this. A uh, good place to start is uh, while you're getting all your visual stuff set up. Um, who here has actually tried to create their own comics or have any experience with it? So yeah, yeah, you're going to learn very quickly. It's a lot of work. Um, it's very exciting. Uh, it's a very, very fun process to be involved with. Um, it's a lot of work, and if you're um, trying to make a living at it, it's an uphill process. Um, there's, to my knowledge, there's no actual direct courses or classes specific to comics. There is one. Okay, one. one. It's okay. it's in New Jersey. It's the Joe Joe Cooper School. Uh, you're, um, you're, you're, I know. I know. Okay. I'm pulling up stuff from All right, so while um, Sal's doing that, I'll talk about some of the um, specific writing skills that are involved in this. Um, there's one thing a lot of people don't realize is that there's a bit of a difference between writing prose stories, like writing these straight up um, text based stories, novels, and things like that, and actually writing uh, scripting for comic books. Um, comic books come in several different varieties. You have books that are one shots. You have ongoing series. You have books that um, every single issue is supposed to be a self-contained story. So there's a lot of different styles and a lot of different ways that you're going to do writing for those things. Um, one thing to keep in mind as you're writing your script is that it is not a written story. It is if you are if you are doing it for yourself, it's a set of notes. If you're doing writing for someone else, for example, um, I do most of the writing for our flagship series. Um, and Sal does the, um, all the storyboards and, and uh, Cindy does the art for them. Um, you have to keep in mind when you are describing a situation in a scene for another person to draw a sequence of actions. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that not every step of a sequence of actions has to be taken into consideration. For example, um, if you were writing, if you were tying your shoe, we all, there's you know, five, six steps to actually tie your shoe. You don't need to show every single step of that. Um, you show the most critical part of that. And when it comes to doing prescriptive, you have to try to keep each panel as a specific beat. Um, we've, had, we've had people who've come in and they've tried to script out uh, stories for us, and they sit and they describe how this character walks over to the window, opens it, looks at the crooks outside, uh, turns around, puts a shirt on, and then in panel two, that's, that's a whole bunch of actions that were actually just preceded in one single panel. Um, and you lot to do. Um, we're actually going to pull up some scripts in here. So what we're going to do is we're actually kind of going through logistically from the beginning to end of the different stages we'll get into um, storyboards and targeting in a second. All right, so here you can see we've done some uh, scripting. Um, scripting is done almost in a really bullet point type fashion. Um, if you think about a page of a comic, it's um, it's you know six or seven panels. It's really six or seven bullet points towards a specific set of things that you're trying to do. Uh, in this particular case, we've got you know, broad panel scotch stands and uh, the wall that shivers where Lawrence is touching it. Um, I don't need to describe in a lot of detail because no one's actually going to read this except for the artist who is actually going to get the chance to um, go through this. And that's something we can start correcting at the, uh, the storyboarding stage, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, you can also see dialogue. Um, the, the, uh, you can see dialogue. These are, so all these points are one thing in one single panel. Um, do you want to talk about um, panels first? Uh, no, go ahead and finish the story. Okay. Stuff. Um, um, one thing that you try to keep in mind if you're doing writing for a comic book is the logical flow of a page of comic. Um, a lot of people can sometimes struggle with this. It's definitely something I know that I really didn't think about when I first started making comics. But essentially, what you try to think about is the moment a person reaches the bottom of a page of a comic, that's a pausing point. Um, to use a television uh, analogy, it would be almost like a scene change or a potential moment for a scene change. 
It's where um, the reader stops and miss a beat and you continue the next page. Um, when you actually do a turn of a page, that's an even longer pause. On the same panel, on the same page, you generally try to avoid changing scenes, uh, jumping back and forth, unless you're specifically trying to go for an erratic, kind of quick paced um, jumping around. But in terms of uh, regular page layout, um, you see you kind of stay within one section for a single page or a spread of a page. And when you get to um, the end of a page, that's where we always call that a held breath um, in, in general in our group. Um, and then that would be a logical moment to jump to another scene or to jump to another uh, point in the story. Uh, the last thing I'll talk about real quick is if you are doing an ongoing series, um, we always call it the last gasp. Um, what are you going to do specifically at the end of the story to try and make sure the person is really interested in picking up the next issue? Um, I don't know how many people we've had read our books and they'll get to the last page of all the comics and then they get mad at us. Yeah. They won't. Yeah. What yeah. happened next? And I'm like, well, that, that's kind of the idea is you want yeah. people to continue to read the comic and to continue to enjoy it. Um, one more thing I'll talk about really quickly. Um, this is a mistake I made a lot um, when I was first starting with writing, is what is in your head is not what they see. It is not what they read. You need to be very clear. You need to make sure things. What's the last time during a conversation you actually said your friend's name? You don't stop, John, and say, you know, what we're doing. You have to make sure to make characters to say each other's names. You have to sometimes um, mention things that might be slightly obvious in normal everyday conversation um, that are actually uh, important beats to uh, make sure that it needs to come across with the characters. So I'm going to start with. So once you have a script and it's broken, oh, oh it's broken. Um, comic books, Generally speaking, except for unless you talk about graphic novels or companions and stuff, generally break down to uh, 22 pages of actual story content. Um, so once you have your script, do you want to do the little story? I don't have any storyboards on this. Can you pull up the camera on that? You can actually focus on this. Make sure you have some storyboards here. I can't pull up my camera on this. Can't. All right. I'll see if I can pull these up and I'll apologize for this. It's one I forgot to put on the computer. I already shared this with several people, and anyone who's interested can feel free to, to come over and look at it. Either, either right after the panel, or if you guys want to come to our table later on. But you can actually see, these are what we call storyboards. And the finished script of the comic is actually done in storyboard format. This is where Sal takes mm -hmm. my scripting and converts it into all the different panels. Takes it and breaks it down into different panels. And we look at pacing and we look at page turns. Um, sometimes I'll write a page and I'll realize that I've crammed I'll realize I've crammed twelve panels into a single page and you know each panel has like five lines of dialogue and I'll realize that there's no way that's ever going to fit on the page. Um, we also uh, work out the speed of the panels, and that's something that Sal will talk about here in just a second. Um, but essentially Visual cues can actually cause a reader to read um, a sequence of panels faster or slower, depending on the way that you do them. Um, and if you take it for a glance, um, I can actually talk about that. Really. Um, actually, if you, if you want to pull, I'll pull up the video. Um, So here's, this is not the actual page of the comic. Actually, no, it's not going to be the, the panels for the computer faster inside of there. Basically, the reason that uh, storyboards are done at such a small scale at this point in the story is they don't have to have a lot of detail. They have the most bare, critical information necessary for the characters. Um, it allows us to stop and look at this and go, you know what, this sequence doesn't make as much sense visually as I thought it was going to, or I didn't describe it properly, or 
didn't um, draw what I had in mind, things like that. It's, it allows you to work out a lot of these little kinks at this stage before you've actually drawn a massive edge of a comic. Um, I'm just going to show um, like some speed on panels. So here's a halfway finished page. This is actually one of the one of the ones that the script person ever showed you. And of the script of this particular issue, where you can see I took the spur boards and I roughed out the characters on top with more detail. In this you already put in the text, we actually find it very helpful when it comes to the, the inking and coloring stage to know where all the text is going to be. It, it makes sure that you don't get to a finished page and start to put lettering and realize that you're covering three quarters of your panel, which is something that we accidentally did a lot when we were starting out. Cover your character's face. You, you want to be able to see your character who's talking. Let's see a point size you use. Uh, is that 10 point, 12 point? Um, usually it's 8 to 10. Um, 8 to 10, and uh, when you're doing lettering, um, you generally always want to make sure you're using a uh, capitalized font. Um, Some we notice that, especially when the font gets smaller, it becomes more and more difficult to read. Um, always try and use a capitalized font, and generally a, a sans serif font, you know, with little braces and curls and things like that. Um, there are several commercial fonts that are available for lettering that are very inexpensive. Uh, I believe the Tim Sale comic font is, is like twenty dollars for a commercial license, um, which means you can actually use it in commercial works and things like that. Um, what was it called? Tim Sale. Tim Sale. Tim Sale. He's actually a comic book creator. Yeah, um, he's, uh, he's actually, he's actually, Blue Line was here. I think actually in has some of the series. Um, S A L A. S A L A. Yeah. Uh, basically, when you this is just really briefly sidestepping. When you use resources like fonts or background images or anything like that, you have to be very careful that you actually have a commercial license to use it. Um, if you're making money from it, it's completely different if you're just using it for your images. So basically, when you use me the pages, the pages are the pages. Yeah. I break it down into storyboards like the ones you saw. And then we do any final checks, like putting the letter in and make sure nobody's covered up and it all fits. And then I start work on the penciling, or in some cases, I'll take it direct to inks if it's digital. When you're doing traditional, it's, it's generally pencils and inks. And we do the work on 11 by 17s, whether it's the traditional or the digital, it'll be uh, the 11 by 17 ratio because when you shrink it down to the comic size, it's actually a different ratio than your normal like that by eleven. Yeah, they're actually they're actually done on a larger paper to allow the artist to get more detail in and not kill their hands by drawing really tiny, really fine details. Um, and these pages are actually scaled down or scaled so that once they are reduced by let's say sixty percent, um, they're actually the size of comic, which is six point six two five by ten point two five. Let me see right here. Yeah, yeah six larger. And another thing we'll have to paper up real quick, if you notice, um, there's different styles of paper for um, intended for different purposes. They have different grades that are intended for, some hold up better for pencils, some are better for inking. Um, it has to do with the, um, the uh, press of the paper. And if you look, all of them have these little hash marks on the sides. And what those actually are is um, they're gutter guides. And if you look at our the big black lines that we have between the panels, those are called the gutters. And these are actually spaced out in thirds or quarters, depending on the type of paper, to allow you to actually line up different points on the paper to create the panels and make sure that they always remain consistent with each other. What about using the Illustrator Photoshop and you now walk on the Actually, um, it's an interesting question. Do you have the template file? Okay. Um, we actually created ourselves a digital template file that would do the exact same thing. And uh, what I actually do is, um, I already created a file that has thirds, quarters, etc. And when I have a sequence of storyboards that we need to do, we literally just go in, erase whichever lines we do or don't need. 
No, um, um, get rid of whatever lines we don't need and construct a garden, and they're always machine perfect. Um, that's if you do it digital. Um, a lot of people are still doing traditional, um, so there's not, there's not to my knowledge, any commercial versions of this kind of thing available. Um, but you easily easy. create yourself. Yeah, this is something I created myself. I took a couple hours and I did all the math and I you know, did all those things. Um, I actually shared with people who want it themselves. So, um, but while I have it open, um, let's go ahead and talk about three trim and uh, cover. So, if you look at a traditional comic, you notice that sometimes art goes all the way to the edge. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, You notice that in, the, for example, you can see here, the art comes all the way to the edge, all the way out. Um, I just realized she was really um, <laughs> she, she, She's possible. Um, um, uh, sometimes the art goes all the way to the edge. Um, this is called bleed and trim. And if you look at the file that I have here, um, it's equivalent to what they have here. Basically, when books are printed, they're printed by machine and there's always some slight variation. No matter how precise the machine is, there's always some slight variation and fluctuation in where the art is placed on the page, in where the machine actually does the cut, where it does the trim, and stuff like that. Um, so because of that, you can see the black page. So yeah, you can see this is black all the way to the edge. Okay, if the black didn't come all the way to the edge and they cut it wrong, there would be a little bit of white or whatever um, background color there was. Um, when you do your art, you always want to do lead, trim, and safe. And this is something that a lot of people have a, a hard time with at first. Essentially, everything in that red zone is going to be cut off. It's going to be cut off and the green is what the final size of the comic is actually supposed to be. But because of the variation, between the different cuts and the prints and the fact that it can have minuscule variations, you don't want to have anything insanely critical within that green section. Because if you have text that is right up in the, um, in the trim zone, it could accidentally get cut off. Uh, that's why if you ever look at a, a comic book, you'll notice that text bubbles, even on a full bleed page, are actually in quite a bit because there can be variations you never want. And what are those dimensions, please? Um, basically, a good idea is to take about a um, quarter inch around whatever size you're doing. So, for any kind of dimensions, quarter inch, and the trim dimensions also quarter inch? Um, we, we, are, we actually play a little bit safer than most people do. Um, I would say it's, we probably go at about an inch for safe. An um, inch? But that's, that's us for you. Of course, I, I say that, and then half the time I don't. So, yeah, so one of those so things so is. It's an inch to be safe, and then. Is bleed there by like half an inch then? Um, well, the bleed, bleed is generally a quarter inch for any kind of printing. Cool. So, I actually want to show some of the things that we're Getting into the artsy part of it, so. Okay, that's fine. Does it make more expensive to bleed? Uh, is it more complicated to have the printing outside? Um, it's, it's necessary. I mean, if you look at some of the pages, like anytime I have stuff where it's white, yeah. you, you're not actually printing, so you can, you can get away with that. But even still, because of the machine, the way it's laid out, even blank space is really not blank space um, it, for the purposes of files when you're, when you're setting things up. So um, there's, no, there's no advantage to, to having a bleed versus not having a bleed as um, far as the printing process? It, 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 they won't printing unless it's already on scale day math by 11 sheets is going to be cut. Right. So you always have to have some leeway for them to be able to cut the paper. So it's not a big deal whether you have bleed or not? Um, it, it doesn't matter. It depends on the style of the book that you want to do. Okay. So, wow. Which we'll actually be getting into the printing process further down the thing. You already told me about this? Yeah. Talk to you about these. Right, well, one saying, uh, I'll go ahead and I'll jump ahead to some of the printing stuff. Um, for anyone who's actually trying to get a go of doing their own comics and their own books, printing actually comes down to two different styles. There's what's called digital printing, which is often called print on demand, and there's offset printing. Uh, digital printing is the kind of printing you do off of your own computer. It's usually RGB, um, you know, run off an electronic machine kind of thing. 
Um, it has the advantage of not being overly expensive. Um, there's no setup costs or anything like that. Offset printing is the process where they actually create plates of different colors for CYMK, and they, they um, are actually stamped onto pages, and those are really meant for larger runs. Um, uh, offset printing is a lot cheaper the more you get of it. Um, if you print 100 copies off on your own computer, it doesn't get any cheaper to produce anymore. If you print two or 3,000 offset copies, it's a lot cheaper than printing 500 digital copies. Um, the advantage of digital is that you, most places will do print on demand, and you can order five or 10 books at a time, um, but you're paying three or four times as much as if you were able to do a run of several thousand offset. It's worth noting that offset printing usually has a setup fee, and so if you get 100 books at an offset place, if they would do a run that small, you would still be paying you might paying be, like $7 a book. Yeah, you might be paying $7 a book, but if you do 5,000 books, you might be paying 80 cents a book. You know, that, that cost is deferred across the number of copies. All right, so going into art. Now, when I do the art, I usually start with the character designs. If you are doing an ongoing book, you actually have the advantage of having character designs pre-made. I mean, when I'm working on issue five, the characters aren't supposed to look any different than they were on issue one. So I make all of these in advance. And I'm used to animation terms because that's where my background was. So we do what we call these turnarounds. You see the character from different angles, so you will always know what they look like from the front, or the, from the back, and so on and so forth. Yeah, you might be doing a book entirely by yourself, or you might be doing something collaboratively. Um, a lot of what we do, we actually have different people working on different sections of the book. And to maintain consistency, it's very important that everyone's pulling from a, a standardized model sheet. It doesn't matter if you're doing it by yourself, you should still yeah, have exactly. a reference. We, there have been times where we've gotten our own characters wrong, or I don't know how many times we've colored Patrick, and yet somehow you can still forget that the back of his ears are a different shape right in his face. Now, this isn't a full color, because the full color version apparently is not in this computer. But I do these, and they also work as coloring models. So when you want to know what, what color are his eyes, what color the inside of his ears, what color is his nose, you can just go and you can select it right off the sheet. It makes coloring a lot faster. How many people here um, prefer to do uh, digital over traditional? Okay. Um, there are some really good tools that are available for this. Um, Photoshop is extremely expensive for most people who are just trying to get started on this kind of thing. Um, this is actually something called Paint Program, uh, Paint Tool SAI, uh, spelled S-A-I, and it has about 90% of the um, drawing capacities of Photoshop selections, layers, all those things, but it only costs $60. So if you're trying to get into the digital stuff, it's a lot easier. Um, if you're doing traditional, um, it also blends the color more beautifully than like any other program. Yeah, saying. it's it's very good for that. Uh, the one thing you can't do is text, so it's not a good program for lettering. And yep. this is actually probably going to be very historic because this is showing up very differently than it is on my screen right now. Favorite tool. Well, while you're starting, I'll talk about the paper. Um, for those people who are more familiar or interested in doing in the traditional method, um, as I explained before, there are different types of paper, different grades that are better for penciling, inking, and uh, different stages of the process. Uh, what will usually happen after the storyboards, someone will lay out the gutters on a page, and you'll have a penciler go over and do the initial lines. Um, if you're doing the inks on a separate sheet, which is usually recommended, um, what they'll do is there's a special kind of tape that you put on the paper, and there's a tool called a light box. And a light box is essentially just what it sounds like. It is a box that shines a light through the paper. And when that happens, you actually get to see the pencil lines through the top sheet of paper so that you can produce inks on it. And when you take away the secondary sheet, you're left with just the ink lines, and they're not, um, uh, not trying, not uh, also covered with pencils. Having to erase things on this kind of paper, especially when you get to the ink stage, can be very destructive to the paper. 
um, and can cause inks to bleed into the paper and they make it for less it good really, lines. It really depends on what kind of paper you it use. Really, yeah, it does. A lot of traditional inkers do ink on pencil. Now, that being said, when you try and look at the different papers, um, there are plenty of people who know the different grades of paper and other good ones stuff. The most expensive paper is not necessarily the best paper for what your specific tool is. Um, some of them are better for uh, pencils, some are better for inks, some are, some are meant for both, some are meant for holding like acrylics and paints for people who do uh, traditional art styles in the world. So are there individuals out there you know, creating pencils, I'll say Photoshop, and turning these pencils over to another artist, creates them also on Photoshop as, as an ink? You know, yeah. That's extremely common. Yeah. That's what we do. Um, I'd say about 75% of what we do now is digital. Um, and actually, um, you see the storyboards that we showed you a minute ago, um, I actually go into my digital file, I create the gutters, and then I actually place these into that template file, and using the storyboard guides that Sal's put in, uh, someone else actually goes in and draws or inks um, directly to that. And when we work, we actually jump back and forth between uh, programs and stuff a lot. So, and then I'll talk about your while you're setting that up. Is you'll notice that these are quite large. Um, they can be very difficult to try and find a place that scans these. Um, these won't fit on a traditional scanner. You need an 11 by 17 bed. A lot of photocopiers also work as scanners um, if you get access to that. There are also a couple of um, commercially available scanners. Um, several of them that are a couple thousand dollars, but there's one or two that cost something like two or three hundred dollars. Um, they're not. Um, they're not. They're not going to last super long. You get like one or two years out of being like we use a news tech scanner. Um, it's about about three hundred dollars. Um, you get a couple of useful years out of it before it starts to kind of conk out. Um, but you can also find places that just commercially scan pages for you. Um, you can find a place that, um, like, there's also types of paper that are available that are actually the same ratio but reduced. Um, it's just really a level of what you're comfortable with doing, um, how small you're um, actually willing to draw. Yes. Um, how do you get the um, Thing that's up there. Like, um, how do you get it onto your computer? Um, I can actually give you the website for it afterwards. Yeah. Um, it's just a, a digital download and purchase. Um, it's from you get it from the website, download it, and install it. Although, while I'm thinking about that, um, <coughs> there's a, um, one of those that you can get with background scenery. Is that what you were just talking about with the copy? Uh, um, you're talking about Mega Studio. Probably. Oh, Mega Studio. Um, yeah, some of those have. Um, they're called uh, half tones or tones, um, and they uh, even even there's even some where you can just buy those textures and use them in these programs themselves too. Uh, but while I'm thinking about that, while sales some of this stuff, uh, another thing to keep in mind is once you get to the stage where even if you're doing this traditionally, you're at some point going to have to scan in the pages of the comic um, because whoever you're going to do the printing for it is going to have to have to show copies of your files. Um, a lot of people don't really understand resolution. Um, resolution or DPI for a digital the comic. Um, any random standard picture that you pick up off the internet, Facebook, things like that, are generally 72 DPI. 72 DPI is really low. It works for displaying things, it doesn't work for printing things. Stuff is generally printed at a minimum of 300, 300 DPI. Um, so when you do your scans of your books, you want to go at least 300 DPI. 
API. Um, higher is better. It's always better to have bigger. Um, there's never really a need to go beyond 600 DPI. Um, once you get past that, it just kind of gets ridiculous. And what do you prefer? Um, generally, we go around 350 to 600. I usually scan really high uh, in case, for some reason, I want to pull up a section of the picture. So for example, if for some reason I wanted to take this one panel and make a poster or a full page ad of something, um, Having the higher resolution means that if you scale it up and drop it into a 300 dpi print file, it doesn't look bad. It doesn't lose resolution. It doesn't become degraded. Cool. Oh, I'm sorry. The ratio on this is actually very different. I was just going to show the difference between uh, gutter colors. Now, you can do gutters in any color you want. Traditionally, they use white or black. And they actually have a very different effect when you read them. For example, let's say you take this, these white gutters. When you look at something with a white gutter, you're more apt to get a pause in the reader between each particular panel. When you do a black gutter, it actually makes it more like watching a movie for some reason. I'm not sure why that is, but I really enjoy the effect. That's why we use it for a lot of our, our cartoony ones, because it gives the effect of watching like an animated film. The way you lay out your panels actually affects the speed in which the reader reads your panels. For example, you could have a panel that's kind of a long vertical panel, like this. Ignore my screwy lines. I cannot draw a straight line. And let's say you have a sequence where you want things to be happening quickly, the, the illusion of, of things that are going one right after the other, right after the other, right after the other. So you would do a panel structure like this because it reads more quickly than if you have to read one big square panel, another big square panel, another big square panel. I mean, it really kind of condenses everything down and gives you the opportunity to put a bunch of quick, small actions. Like if you had a fight sequence where, you know, people were getting punched and flung all over the place, you would probably do something like this. And if you invert it, and if I was to take this, and do instead these long horizontal panels, It actually has kind of an opposite effect, especially if you put the black in between, of making something almost like, um, like when you first go into a movie and you have your wide scene where you see everything as yes, panoramic. That's the word I was before. So it, it kind of gives you the panoramic feel. You're seeing the whole city, the whole mountain, the whole you know forest, and it, it's a great way to bring your reader in, is to have a big open shot where you see everything. The other advantage is. I, I don't know about other people, but I have trouble with backgrounds sometimes. And worst of all is when you have a bunch of characters and then you also have a background, because if you're not careful, your background can distract from the characters that you're actually supposed to be paying attention to. Now, you don't want that to happen. You want readers to focus on the most important part. Now, if you really want them to see like the giant ship and that's the important part of your background and your characters are just kind of there, that's one thing. But normally you want to be seeing your characters and what they're doing. So what you do is you do your big establishing shot. It shows you where everything is. Like if I was doing a comic about this panel, I did this big establishing shot of the entire room. You'd see all the people, you'd see the projector, all that kind of stuff. And then you know that you are in this room and until they, told otherwise. And the next several shots can just be close-up headshots of the characters talking, yeah. or close-in on specific people saying in the audience or anything like that. You don't need to have the entire background of the shot because you've already done your big establishing shot. So that's that's one way of, of kind of simplifying everything so you don't have to feel the need to do that in every panel. And it's, it's a kind of a thing where you, if you do, in fact, change from another scene, you want to make sure to do your establishing shot of that scene too so that people know that you are in a different location. I mean, I wouldn't want to do this, and then you have this panel. Close that. Or you have a panel, and... That would be too many panels. Mm -hmm. It'd be far too many panels. This is the thing I tell them not to do. You wouldn't want to have a panel of 
here in the room and all of a sudden you're in a spaceship and you don't understand that there's a scene change there. You feel like, well, why is everyone floating now? Particularly if the characters are close in. And yeah. So, you have a so instead you would show the panel of the established shot of the room in the spaceship and then you realize, okay, now, now we're in a different location. I'm going to do a different thing, different expectations of your environment. So it's one of the things about a setting you really have to keep in mind when you're doing that. You can do it if you're trying to deliberately jar your audience, but that's not the case most of the time. Um, I actually don't have any storyboards to because I am so efficient. <laughs> I have finished all my storyboards. I'm pretty sure I have storyboards. Now, I don't do this very much because I actually, uh, I do a lot of digital coloring, and digital inking, but a lot of inkers, when you, when you do your pencils and you, let's say you get someone else's ink, if you had in your pencils, let's say these are pencils and not, not ink pages, you would do all your details, and then when you go to get your inker to do your inks, you will actually make indications of what sort of ink style you want. For example, let's say I want all this to be black. Well, I'm not going to draw it all in black in pencil. I'll just put these X's on it, and the inker knows this is supposed to be all black. Fill it. For example, if you go to a Batman comic, compared to the Superman comic, there's a lot of difference in contrast of light and, and surface. You see the um, silhouettes, and you X those out so the inker knows they should be black. You can do that for yourself, too, if you're going through and doing all your pencils at once and then all your inks. So you remember, because... Can you treat me for the reference? Yeah. All right. So now this is, um, this is digital, but you would also be getting the same effect if you are doing traditional. Um, if I was talking about where before, if you were shining a light through your pieces of paper, you would be getting this basic effect on the second sheet of paper. So this is the stage where um, the, the uh, anchor will add definition and uh, finish to a piece. It's worth noting that this is different because I'm making my own work. Right. If you were get working with another anchor, you actually want to have detailed pencils. These are storyboards. Yeah. Yeah, these are storyboards, and because um, because Sal's actually doing things um, herself, she's very familiar with the characters. Um, she knows what the Scotch and the swirl look like. There's no need to go into all the detail um, just yet. If you are handing this off to someone else, it's very important, very critical, to have as much stuff in there as possible. Uh, I know we've done one or two books where we've handed it off to someone, and they send it back, and they completely misunderstood what we had intended for one of these panels. And instead of instead of being like indoors, they were like on a boat all of a sudden, and they just they had no idea what we were doing. And it was because we had never done a work where we had to really detail and show someone else, and they kind of didn't read the script when they were uh, actually doing their inks. You know, it's it's understandable. You want to make everything as clear for your collaborative artists as you can. I assume a lot of people here though are probably going to be doing most of it themselves. If you're an artist you're probably going to be working on most of the art yourself because you don't want to have to pay someone else to do the work. And that's good when you're just getting started if you have the skill, you know. And if, even if you are still learning, just doing this over and over again is going to teach you a lot. I have learned more doing comics than I ever knew, uh, like from tutorials and, and classes and things like that. It's one of those experiences where jumping in and doing it over and over again is going to teach you. So. Is it relevant? Because this is pretty <coughs> But for, for those of you who are doing your own work, I definitely recommend model sheets. You want to have consistency. You want to work on being some basic skills like um, perspective and anatomy. You can get by without them for a while, but you, you really kind of have to add them to your your uh, inventory of abilities. Which comes with some things like character design. 
character design is one of those things, how many people here are, are in the process of making their own comic? You have an idea, you have a story, and you want to make it into a comic. How many of you have characters in mind already? Have you done the designs for your characters yet? Yeah. Have you ever heard of the silhouette rule of character design? Okay. Can you tell me, from looking at these silhouettes with no lines, who these different characters are? Okay. At least you won't mistake this character for this character, because they look very different in silhouette. If you can tell your characters apart in silhouette, it's a really good thing. That's why characters like Batman have such distinctive silhouettes. You see a, a guy crouching, he's got the ears, he's got the, the kind of spread cape, and you know, well, it's Batman, you know. You're like not example, Simpsons. Or you, there's no way you would mistake Marge Simpson for any other character. Um, <laughs> yeah. in, in the Avengers, I mean, you know, in, in some cases, a character um, shape may not be overly different. For example, a lot of spandex superheroes are actually very similar, but they'll have different body language. Um, Spider-Man sitting still is a lot different than Iron Man sitting still. Um, they have different that Can Iron both. Man sit? I don't know if you can't sit. <laughs> but you know, you're saying is um, you can tell the character even if they're in uh, chef. It's very important that you can tell characters apart, um, especially in situations where it's low light or um, you know you're trying, you're trying to do any kind of um, darker tones. And that's one of the one of the things that we usually do when we do the character design. We have all our characters, and then we put them in the silhouette test. Can we tell who this is, who this is, who this is? Now, also going into character design for a second is there is a grade at which you need to stop on the character. If your character is overly generic and there's nothing really unique or standing out about them, they're going to just kind of fade into the background and no one's really going to be aware that this is your main character over another character. Well, um, that, that could be the purpose. Of well, it can, it can be. You, you specifically go after something yes. specific in that case. Um, but then the flip side of that is, if you create a character who is, you know, three-headed, winged gypsy dancer with, you know, 500 bells, that's a really awesome character design, but the second you have to draw that 400 times in one issue, you're going to start regretting every single one of those little lines and details. Some details can be done during um, coloring stages, they don't have to be done by the artist, which is very lucky if you're going to get off. Um, I would still try to avoid that because your colorist may not want to do that detail all the time. And then you find your bill for coloring may suddenly. If, if you look at some sort of very classic characters, I mean, Superman, Batman, their costumes aren't overly complex, but they're very distinctive. Um, the colors that they choose, the places in uh, which they do the uh, changeovers and colors and things like that. Giant symbols um, on their chest. But at the same rate, if you look at, if you remember, it's probably in the 90s, there was a run of characters who, they, they invented so many new characters, there were so many new comics that came out, and people tried all kinds of new art styles and stuff like that. And a lot of those characters never show up again, because those characters that had overly intricate designs and styles and 3,000 you know, different marks on their costumes, kind of either got simplified or kind of disappeared because they were really a pain in the butt to draw over and over again. <laughs> so, character design, first and foremost. Your characters are the driving force of your story, unless you're doing something like a horror where everyone's going to die anyway. In which case, your villain is the driving point of your story. But having your character designs established beforehand is very important. Then you get to taking your script and making them your storyboards as we demonstrated already. And then the fun part. For every artist, my, my favorite is the penciling part because that's the part where you have to do all the things that are loose and then kind of tighten them gradually. And it's more forgiving than inks because when you ink and you get it wrong, then you have problems. Whether you're whether you're doing the work by yourself or you actually are collaborating with someone, this is actually one of the stages where things can start to evolve a little bit. Um, I'll usually have something specific in mind in that script, and then there's certain sections of the script where I've 
I've been more vague, or I haven't put in as much detail as to what's supposed to actually go on there. And, and Sal will start drawing something, and I'll slip in little things that I didn't even think about, um, fun stuff in the background. Um, maybe our comics in specific, there's, a, there's a, uh, a bearded penguin in every single book we've ever done. And mm. most people don't realize that. And we've got hardcore fans that have never realized that. Um, but we always look at it as like an Easter egg. And there's just so much fun stuff you can start to sneak in. Sorry. Interrupting my Where was I? I'm a writer. I like to talk. <laughs> I guess. Tell me stories. Um, you can work out a lot of kinks in the, in the work in your penciling stage. So for me, that's actually one of the most important parts because you want to get everything worked out. And you don't want to be doing too much work in your inking stage, if you're honest. Um, it's not as forgiving, and it's just it's it's not a great medium for making changes. I mean, you can get lots of white acrylic, but I, I still don't recommend it. And then comes the part that I dislike the most, and that's coloring. You know, how many people here do a lot of coloring, like digital coloring? Um, you can do traditional coloring for comics. I will warn the biggest problem with traditional coloring for comics is simply that scanners don't scan traditional colors. You know, if you're shaking your head, you know exactly what I mean. You do some colored pencil, you do some marker, you do some colored pencil. Scanners just scan some colors. It takes half a Another drawback is it's very expensive. If you're doing Copic markers or um, certain mediums, um, it's very expensive and it's difficult to correct. Um, on, the, uh, on the traditional piece. If anyone here is interested in doing traditional media pages, my recommendation is totally forget the scanner. Get to go to someone who does professional um, photography and get them to take photographs of your work instead. Sure that, that, it, that works so much better and you're just going to come out with a lot nicer result. But for the rest of you, digital. Digital is faster, it's easier. You can correct all your little color things as you know. And when you print it, you'll get a nice crisp quality. And that's why that's why um, studios now do all of their work. As a side note, when you're working, it's usually better to try and be in CYMK mode um, for offset printing. It's easier to convert to RGB than it is to do a CYMK. Um, there's some slight loss when you go from RGB to CYMK. So it's better to do it in the offset printing format and then print digital from there. Why would you go to RGB? Um, the only reason would be if you're only doing digital. Um, also, um, websites don't acknowledge CYMK format. They won't so open CYMK files. If you're, if you're oh, opening a file, you can convert it. Gotcha. Yeah. Now, he's more sure this, but I'm going to tell you right now, if you're using site or open CYMK files, so the important part to me is make sure whatever program you use, whatever setting you use, that it is consistent. If I do all my pages in RGB, it's fine, as long as I'm doing them and not converting them in between. So, yeah, we would avoid that. <coughs> Go ahead and do it in the program available. And just know that whatever color you pick is not necessarily going to be how the color looks when it's printed. Um, this is actually not a clipping thing. This is the features, one of the features I like inside. You can take something and set it as a selection source. And then when I take my bucket, which was a selection source, and click on anything, it will draw from the lines layer that I have selected here. So I can color in this or this and just click on it and color it right in. Oh, Isn't yeah. that so fast? I, I learned that and I was like, that's so amazing. <laughs> I've been using Sci for a whole year now and I've been like coloring it in. Yeah. Here's, here's what you can do if your lines are solid like these ones here. You take it, you set it to your working layer, fill in everything, and then take your magic wand tool, set that to your selection source. Select everything, delete it. Look, my lines are all colored in. I feel like I've gotten so much done. And then I can use my second favorite trick, which is 
Does anyone here know what a clipping group is? Works in both Photoshop and Sun? Well, for those who don't know what the group is. I'm about to explain it. <laughs> okay, let's say that I am lazy and I want to do character markings and I don't want to, have to color it all in by hand like she was talking about. Which is true. It is, it is very true. I am extremely lazy. So I take my dark color and I'm like, okay, I'm going to color in his paws. Man, I just can't color the lines. I hated coloring books as a kid. <laughs> Look at I know, look at this. It looks terrible. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to attach this layer to the layer below it. So that everything on this layer only shows up when there's something underneath it. Oh my god, look. I don't have to worry about coloring inside the line. I can color wherever. <laughs> right? And if I unclip it, but this is why I never unclip it. Never unclip it, okay? <laughs> so yeah, that saves a lot of time if you're like, if you have to go in and do their hands all the time, uh, or gloves, right? Oh, their little fingers. Anything that, you know. Yeah. And it's also really useful if you're ever using something with a gradient that might bleed over. Because, you know, that's what it is. <laughs> I actually started her. We should have done. We should have done a separate, uh, separate panel that was all for science and teach you all how to use it. Although that being said, um, we actually do uh, live streams uh, where you can actually watch us doing art and working on comics and stuff on our website. And we take requests and do tutorials. We take requests and tutorials and stuff. So. so and that's free to watch. So after you've got all your colors, and one thing to keep in mind with colors is make sure. Did, how many people know anything about contrast and, and stuff like that? Let's say you do this character, and he's all this brown color, and then you add his markings in, and his markings are his green color, right? First off, I would question your color choices. <laughs> <laughs> do not question my color choices. Yeah. Well, this is fine. But sometimes you get to a point where you do one color and then you do another color. And what you don't realize is that these colors, I select them. I wonder if it was blue. Let's deselect that. Okay. You got your red, and then you got your blue. These colors actually have the same value. They're both in the same spot. So if you were to ever convert this to gray, they both be the exact same shade of gray. And you don't want that because what if your character is like this and he's got the red body and the blue markings? You turn it to gray, you never see it. So you want to be careful to pick different contrasts of colors. You have some bright, some really saturated colors, and then some, you know, some of the darker or some of the lighter colors to create a, a, an effect. And when you have backgrounds and foregrounds, you can also use that. Like your characters can be brighter, and your backgrounds can be less saturated, and it pulls your characters forward so you see them better. Since we're sure writing a lot of them, we're just going to switch questions. Um, yeah, okay. I wouldn't bother to. Too much more on like, the lettering yeah, um, stage. Because we decided to do lettering. Um, <laughs> I can't, if I can't do lettering inside. So, all right, we'll go ahead and uh, jump over to some questions. Um, and I've got a couple of little points that I can cover on. So, does anyone have any uh, questions that jump out of How about a generic font that might be available on Photoshop or whatever just to, to, to rough in your dialogue? Um, there are different fonts. Um, there's. Don't use comics. Don't use comics. <laughs> <laughs> For anything. I heard a bunch of laughs, so um, I'll know it. Well, no, it's um, you know, papyrus. Um, yeah, papyrus. Everything tires. Everything tires. Everything tires. Don't use papyrus. No, no, he would be so bad. I'm sorry. I'm trying to remember one of the three. Well, someone's doing that. There's. There's several font sites online that have free fonts. Yeah, Just be sure that when you look at them, make sure that the, uh, they'll all have license agreements for them. Yeah, you, can, you can just look up comic fonts and get free fonts. Okay. Uh, but again, just always make sure that they specifically have commercially available licenses. Um, 
Defont.com, D-A-N-O-S-T.com, Here's what it's Font scroll or something like that. Um, font block and stuff like that. There's a lot of fonts for it. You type in font and you'll, you'll get up a ton of things. Just keep in mind where, no matter where you go that it says that it has a license that's free for um, commercial use. If not, you can also choose to pay the $20 for the font and you will know that you have a license for commercial use, which is usually better in, in like specialized fonts. Like if you want to do Something very sci-fi and very sci-fi font. You'll probably have to wind up paying <coughs> to use that. Um, yes. I mean, um, hard my ignorance, but what's wrong with comic sounds? Um, if there's actually nothing wrong with it. Um, it just is a question of one of those way, way overused things. Um, people were using it for things that had nothing to do with comics, and in the world of fonts, it's kind of almost a new joke. Um, where people use comic sounds when they don't have anything when they have else. nothing else. It's um, kind of like when the song is played over and over. Yeah, it's like, it's like an overplayed song. Um, it's it's actually people who have no idea about fonts. Ninety percent of the world can recognize comic sounds, and it's just you can use it um, if you don't have anything else available, especially if you're just working at um, you know figuring things out. It's just sort of a, an in joke to in the world. Of. I, I kind of like the way it looks personally. And, and, and speaking of fonts, don't, don't you think that um, comics that have that have upper and lower case letters in them both look, for lack of a better word, look more literate than the ones that are in all caps? They can. Um, even still, I would actually recommend doing um, the uh, larger scale um, capitals where you can have a large capital T and then all the rest of the letters um, still in capitals. Um, if you get into the uh, non-capitalized fonts, um, you gotta make sure that the, the font is large enough to read. Um, it's one of those things that gets um, really tricky very quickly. Um, it really comes down to what size your font really comes out on the page. I, I like that idea. Like, maybe if you ran it, I could say 12 point and 14 point. Mm -hmm. Use up for lower case that way, mm -hmm. for more literal. It's, it's really, it's all personal taste. Everything we've said is all personal taste. Um, you're going to find people who completely do the exact opposite of certain things we've said if it works for them. Um, the one thing to keep in mind is you need to be able to read it. Yes, sure. Um, always do a test print or proof or mock up, things like that. Um, always make sure that it's very easy to read. Um, our early books had the, the large and small font of text, and it just became very difficult to read. Less yeah. text, more pictures. Well, you know, it depends if you're asking the writer or the artist. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, for the uh, font or the uh, word face, upper place case, does this go for the, the words in the bubble as well as the descriptions in the little boxes? Should um, be upper and lower in both, or just upper and the bubble? You can, I think you can get away more easily with the upper and lower case if you're doing um, the narrative boxes. Narrative boxes. Okay. When you're doing people talking, it's usually not as good an idea. Um, I've used, I've also seen it used where they will use um, all lowercase for an emphasis or the indication that the characters are whispering. But you can also use italics or a small font for that too. It's really, it really depends on how you decide to do it. But remember, consistency is key. Yeah, if you are doing it one way in the first five pages, you don't want to switch it the other way in the next five pages. And then the thing is, no matter, like I said, no matter what we say, play around, try it. You might go, oh, you know what, this guy's kind of crazy, this looks great. <laughs> or you might you might go, no, I know what I'm talking about, I do it, and you find out what those guys were right. This is awful. I mean, just always test it out, always play with it, never be afraid to experiment. Um, both of us knew absolutely nothing about comic books when we originally started. We didn't, we didn't have backgrounds in it. Um, now it's our full time job. Um, it's how we make our game. This is all stuff we all learned just by practicing, trying things out, not being afraid to experiment. Um, you know, figuring out as you go along, um, and you know, just trying to learn something like that. I will, I would say, if you're going to be doing coloring, do a little bit of research on color theory and color wheels. I've had people who have, have commissioned comics or commissioned characters, and they've gotten these character, these color combinations 
colors are all fine on their own, and when you put them together, they look really, really bad. Actually, we did that too. Oh no, it wasn't as bad as no, this. No, no, like, no, no. Um, when we did our first comic, it was a black and white comic, but we designed the characters in color. And uh, so we went and we colored the book as if it was color, but then we grayscaled it, and as we showed earlier, where all the tones were very similar, we found out that the characters kind of bled into each other. Or conversely, we started in black and white, and we knew what these characters were going to look like in color, and then we got to the first issue that we actually did in color, and we realized that this character looks great, and this character looks great, they look terrible beside each other because their color sets are just so obtrusive to one another that it was, it was... Well, I mean, if you take a color and you put it next to another color, like you take the green and you put a blue next to it, the blue looks different next to the green than the red looks next to the green. So keep that in mind too when you make the color sets. Look at the colors not just individually, but how they're going to look together because that's going to make a big difference. If you have a shade of gray, it's going to look dark when you put it on a white bright white background and light when you put it on a black background. So we have time for one more. Is there any last question? Yes. Do, do you have any advice on getting one's work published? Um, that's a really good question. And we actually we actually do a, um, have a, a paper on uh, publishing. Um, there's a big difference between trying to get your um, to publish for yourself and get your own books produced and to get published. Um, the most important thing to remember is just that um, just um, find out the specific policies of the particular place you're looking for is. Different companies have different policies on how to approach. Um, a lot of people decide that they're going to go to a convention and they'll go up to a table and they'll show their stuff. And a lot of places are perfectly fine with that. They absolutely love it. Other places will tell you, no, you need to go to our submissions policy on our website. Regardless of what you do, um, if you are trying to get your stuff published to someone else, it's usually a very good idea to try and make sure you have copy mark, uh, copyrights and or trademarks in place before you show something to someone else. Um, some places actually won't even accept submissions um, um, from, 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 original from, from, from original works for various reasons. For example, us in the early days, we didn't accept submissions early on because we had several books that hadn't come out yet. And we didn't want someone to come up and say, oh, well, I've got this book about candy animals. And look, oh, we already have a book about candy animals. But if it's not out yet, they don't want to seem like they've um, basically stolen someone's idea. So a lot of places have very specific submission policies. They'll want, instead of sending everything you've done, they'll ask you to send a small sample, maybe one or two pages, depending on if it's, um, mm. if it's script or if it's actually um, comic Now, books. for an artist, biggest recommendation have a portfolio. Have one online, have one in a book like this, or smaller. Don't have too many pieces. You don't want to sit and make them wade through 500 sketches and, and for, pencil pictures. You for do. artists, be very clear to the point. Uh, make sure you show that you can do sequentials. Make sure that you can show that you are doing uh, characters that look the same consistently across pages, that you can draw a character over and over again, and they always pick that same character. Also, be sure to show whatever you're applying for. If you're only applying to be a colorist, it's okay to not have pencil pencil work. You can just show them while you're published. For a writer, um, when you come to you doing um, your submissions, you have to remember, it's, we call it the elevator pitch. You have 30 seconds to try and impress or get your point across. And after that point, people are going to space out. Um, people get lots of submissions. Um, it's really important to try and make sure that within just a, um, within just a few seconds, you've gotten your entire point across. Um, when you do your own book, you'll have the luxury of being able to space the story along as much as you want, but when you're trying to uh, do a pitch either to a publisher or even to a potential client, if you're setting up at a um, Comic Con and selling your books directly to someone, you only have a brief window, 15 to 30 seconds, to really get a point across. Those of you who have come to our table and have heard me do the pitches know exactly what I'm talking about, where I've got uh, like a 10 second version of each of the comics that I do to try and um, give as much information as possible about what it is without getting into specific details. When you're submitting for a script, like if you have an original work, you want to have not only your pitch, but also have handy your outline of what it is you're, you're trying to write, and also various other things, like you want to let people know that you know what you're doing. Like um, and A good example is we've had people pitch comics to us, and I've seen their script, I'm like, this is great, okay, how much do you have written out? Oh, just the first issue. Well, no, I 
I don't, want, I don't even want to see this until your six, six issues flat Well, I mean, it's most, most companies that will work from a, an outline. It's the same with book publications, like if you're, if you're submitting for a novel. They want you to have your pitch, your outline, and then maybe X amount of chapters initially. And that works pretty well for comics, too. As, as well as it does for prose. So how do you get uh, copy for Copyright? Yeah. Um, there, there's a uh, the website for, um, I'm going to see so I can write on the name. Um, but by default, um, a work is copyrighted when you declare it, but you can legally declare something copyrighted by actually submitting copies of them to, um, I forget the branch of the government that actually deals with it, but you just look up uh, American copyright, um, and you just send the forms. Um, a copyright is basically on um, a specific work, um, trademarks are on specific images or on logos. So for example, this book is copyrighted to us, but this logo, which is the logo we use for all these characters, is a trademark of us. Um, and that's one of those other ones that kind of... You just pushed a spider on that logo? Thanks, <laughs> 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 Happy ending. Yeah. Um, right, um, the other thing about copyrights, whenever you produce an image online, and you post it, that can be evidence of a copyright, but you have to make sure to put the dates. dates. And that's covered here. Um, like I said, it's just always good to make sure you always have that somewhere. So, um, thank you all very much for joining us. Um, I hope you guys learned something that was useful. And uh, we can have our fire table and come over by and talk to us directly. Um, we can answer any other questions you guys have. We also have our portfolios. We do also have portfolios. Thank you very much.